Our theme is praying with eternity in view. In our story that Brother Snipes led us in reading this morning, we see a little phrase where one of the, 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 the disciples say to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. And in this passage, we get a sneak peek into the prayer life of Jesus. Can you imagine being that disciple, listening to the Son of God talking to his Father? Can you imagine being that one kind of eavesdropping on Jesus as he talks to God? It's, it, it was God talking to God. And as he listens and waits for him to finish, I'm sure that he was overwhelmed and captivated by what he just observed. And I wonder if he was fascinated with Jesus' relationship with his father. You ever listen to someone pray and say to yourself, wow, this, this person really, really knows the Lord. You know, for me, it was Sam Sprunger. When I'd hear him pray, I would, all, I would always think, boy, that man really knows the Lord. And it's such a, such a blessing to, to know people who, who know how to pray. You know, if we're not careful, our prayers become perfunctory with no thought to who we're talking to or what we're saying or asking. And we need to pray and, and, and ask God, help us that our prayers not be that way. Even our simple prayers at mealtime, that they just not be a prayer out of ritual, but they be out of a sincere heart, asking and talking to the Lord. I want to give you some thoughts about this. Prayer derives from having a relationship with God the Father. Without having a relationship with God, it's very difficult to pray. Beginning at salvation, accepting Christ as our Savior is where it all begins. And many of us this morning remember the day that we trusted Christ as our Savior. And that was the beginning point because prior to our salvation, there was no relationship with God. But when Christ came into our hearts and the Holy Spirit came to our life, that began a journey of the, of the Christian life and also an opportunity to pray to a God who, who, who listens and hears the prayers of his children. And by the way, if you're here this morning and you're not 100% certain that if you died, you'd go to heaven, as was prayed earlier in, in, in a prayer, this would be a good day to get saved. This would be a good day to humble yourself before God and admit that you've sinned against him and understand the penalty of hell and trust Christ to save you and take you to heaven. And we'll give you opportunity at the end of the service to come forward and talk to someone at the altar and let someone take the Bible and show you how to be saved. How many of you remember when someone took the Bible and showed you how to be saved? Look around. You can see many, many hands that are raised. And that relationship with God from salvation continues as a child of God and as we talk to God as our Father with reverence and respect. But I want you to notice their request. Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. They didn't, he didn't ask, Lord, teach us how to pray. Lord, just teach us to pray. Our greatest need is not to try and master a specific technique or approach in prayer, but simply to pray. There's nothing wrong with messages or sermons about prayer, and, and we've heard some this year already, and and we ought to listen, and we ought to take notes, and we ought to pay attention, and we ought to apply those messages to our life. But really, it's not about how I pray, it's, it's, it's do I pray? And God's more interested in the fact that we pray than he is the words that we say, or the technique that we have, or this, the, the order in which we, we pray. God's interested in, in wanting us to pray. God wants us to pray about everything. Take your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. In verse number 6, the Bible says, Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. God wants us to pray 
about everything. You say, what should I pray about? Everything. Everything. That's what God wants. And by the way, the Bible says be careful with nothing. He says don't worry about anything. Just pray about everything. I've learned so much about prayer through our pastor. And uh, he loves to pray. And I, and I appreciate a pastor who loves to pray. Sometimes in the middle of a, of a, of a conversation or a middle of a meeting, he'll just stop. And I'm thinking, we got work to do. We don't have time to pray, but he'll stop and pray. And not to impress people in the room, but it's an understanding that we need the Lord. We need God. And we need God to be part of our lives, and we need to pray about everything. God wants us to pray fervently. Take your Bibles and turn to James chapter 4. I'm sorry, James chapter 5. In verse number 16, James chapter 5 and verse 16, the Bible says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another, another that ye may be healed. And then the last phrase, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. God wants us to pray fervently. He wants us to pray with passion. He wants us to pray with emotion. He wants us to pray with feeling. And then God wants us to pray constantly. In Thessalonians, the Bible says, pray without ceasing. To be a man, to be a woman, a teenager, a child that prays, there has to be a desire. And this is evident by the request, Lord, teach us to pray. And I'm sure the disciple, after observing and, and, and eavesdropping on our Savior, praying to God, something stirred inside his heart as he realized there, there's something inside me that wants to pray. In Proverbs 18, verse 1, the Bible says, Through desire a man having separated himself seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. You know, he could have asked Jesus many things, but he asked him, Teach us to pray. Psalm 37, verse 4, the Bible says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Our desires will change and align with what God wants for our life when we delight ourselves in him. Amen. I think the more we spend time with God, the more we want what God wants. Good. I think the more we spend time in church and listen, listening to messages and listening to the word of God and we spend time on our knees, we spend time walking with God, the more we, we align our, God aligns our hearts with his heart. And I can't help but wonder, when, when you think about what does God want more than anything else, I think God wants man to be reconciled with him. Listen, God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. Amen. He's not willing that any should perish. I don't know about you, but I don't want anybody to go to hell. I don't want my neighbors to go to hell. I don't want my friends to go to hell. I don't want my family members to go to hell. I don't want our visitors that are here today to go to hell. I don't want Hammond to go to hell. I don't want Chicago to go to hell. And I believe with all my heart that the nearest, dearest, closest thing to the heart of God is that people would be saved. And this begs the question, do we have a desire to be a person of prayer? Is there something in our heart that says, I want to be a person that prays? To be someone that prays, there has to be a humility to learn. Lord, teach us. Lord, teach us. I want to learn. I, I want to learn more about this discipline of, of, of prayer. I don't know anybody who would say they've mastered the, a prayer life. I think even some of the, the men that we've known that have come across this pulpit who have been great men of prayer, I think of Tom Williams, would, would say, I, there's so much, I need, so much more I need to learn about prayer. I think it takes being teachable. It takes a heart that wants to learn and, and, and then apply to our life. How can we pray with eternity in view? What can I include in my prayer life that will include this idea of eternity? Just a few thoughts on this. One, we need to pray for souls to be saved. We need to pray locally and we need to pray globally that people would come to know the Lord. 
In 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, the Bible says, Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. God wants everybody to get saved. Boy, we need not to miss that. God wants everybody to be saved. He's not willing that any should perish. In Romans chapter 10, verse 1, the Bible says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Paul prayed many prayers. He prayed about many things. But his number one prayer, the prayer that he prayed more than any other prayer, was that Israel would be saved. Someone needs to pray that Hammond would be saved. Those of us who live in Hammond need to make that our, our number one prayer. Someone needs to pray for your city, your town, where you live. Someone needs to pray for your bus route or your Sunday school class. Someone needs to pray for Chicago, that Chicago would be saved. We need to pray for souls to be saved as we think about praying with eternity in view. God, save the lost. God, save the lost. I wonder who prayed so that you could be saved. I wonder who went on their knees and prayed for that event that you attended. Maybe it was a camp or maybe it was a youth conference. Maybe it was a Sunday morning or a Sunday night service. I wonder who prayed in that service like was prayed today that somebody would be saved and somebody prayed and you were saved. We need to pray with eternity in view that souls be saved, and then we need to pray for laborers. Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to Matthew chapter 9. In Matthew chapter 9, let's look at verse number 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as having sheep, having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. You know, it's an interesting fact that Jesus was moved with compassion when he saw the multitudes. The Bible says, mine eye affecteth my heart. You know, it's hard to visit a large city or see a large group of people and not be moved with the thought, I wonder how many of, of these people are going to die and spend eternity in hell. Last week, my wife and I were in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, and a city of 1.3 million people and there's only three solid soul winning churches in that city trying to reach 1.3 million people for the Lord China with its 1.4 billion India 1.3 billion and on and on and on it goes our country 331 million people live in our country and the billions of people that live around the world. And the Bible says that when Jesus saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion. And we need to pray for laborers. We need to pray that God would call young men and young ladies to serve him with their lives. Amen. We need to pray for Hiles Anderson College. We need to pray for Bible colleges all around the country that are trying to train young people to serve the Lord. We have a group of young people that are coming in just a few days freshmen that'll be homesick, nervous, scared. We need to pray that they'll finish what they, what they start, that they'll live for God and serve God with their lives as God has called them. We need to pray for souls to be saved. We need to pray for laborers. And then lastly, and this, would, this one might be a little, a little harder to pray, but we need to pray that God would help us do our part. What do you mean by that? I mean more than praying that people would be saved, I need to be a soul winner. Not to minimize praying for souls, I, absolutely. But I think along with my prayer for, for souls to be saved, I need to be in personally involved. I need to do my part. And I need to pray, pray to God that God would help me do my part. 
that I would be a soul winner, that I would do my, what I can to win people to Christ. More than praying that God would send laborers. I need to be a laborer. Thank you for praying for our college. Thank you for praying for our conferences and our camps that young people would, would rise up and surrender their life to serve the Lord. But <clears throat> maybe more than just pray for that, maybe I need to be a laborer. Maybe I need to work on a bus route. Maybe I need to be part of a soul winning ministry. Maybe I need to do something to be part of the group of people that are laboring to win people to the Lord and disciple people for Christ. James 4, 17, the Bible says, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. We need to pray, God, help me. God, help me. There's four things that I want to pray that God would help me as a soul winner. Number one, I want to pray that God would help me be conscious about souls. You know, if, if you're like me, it's so easy to kind of go through life and not even think about it. Pastor likes to say that, uh, who, who gives out tracks? Those who have tracks. I like to say, though, who has tracks? Those who never give them out. That was a joke, just kidding. But we need to be soul conscious. We need to be thinking about people that we come across who need a, need a witness or need a, need a gospel tract. And we need to ask God, God help me to be soul conscious. Good. We need to ask God to help us to be consistent. Consistent in our soul winning. Some of us remember 5, 10, 15 years ago, we won a soul to Christ, but how about in recent weeks or recent months? We, we've lost a consistency in our soul winning, and we need to ask God to help us be consistent, Good. be regular. By, by the way, it's hard to be regular and consistent if you're not part of something or have a place and a time of the week where you go and, and tell people about the Lord, and then we need to be committed. We need to be committed to this idea of winning people to Christ and discipling converts. We need to ask God to help us. God, help me to be committed. You know, I read this morning in, in Psalm 49, the Bible says, For when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. We take nothing with us when it's over. And the only thing that we, we have when we go to heaven is what we did for the Lord. It's what we did for God. And God could care less about our house, our car, our, our bank accounts, and he, cares, he doesn't care about any of that. What he really cares about is what did we do for eternity. I need, to be, I need to pray and ask God to help me be conscious and consistent, committed. And then I want to ask God to help me be convicted. I don't know about you, but I, I rarely ever, ever hear a, a message or a lesson taught about soul winning where I'm not convicted. And I want to be convicted. I want it to bother me. And I want it to bother me to the point where I do something about it. Good. And I need to ask God to help me have a part. Help me do what I can for eternity. We need to pray for souls be saved. We need to pray for laborers. And we need to pray that God would help us do our part. Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. That's your prayer this morning? God just, God, just teach me to pray. I just need to pray. I need to pray consistently. I need to pray regularly. I need to pray daily. I need to pray without ceasing. God, Lord, teach us to pray. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father.